Welcome again to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in training, Tanisha Shades-Bain. This week we're going to answer some of your questions that you sent in for us, but before we do that, let's meet our panel of experts and have them introduce themselves. So Jim, we'll start down here with you. Hey, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist at the University of Illinois. Okay, Marty? Hi, I'm Marty Alanya. I'm a landscaper. All right. And I'm Jim Appleby, a retired entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. All right, so we've got two Jims today. <laughs> All right, so we've got some show-and-tells to get to, and Jim, we'll start with you. You uh, brought in some things that you want to share? Yes, I have uh, two diseases that show up on crab apples. Okay. And they're very distinct in January, I mean, uh, May, June, but they look alike in August. Interesting. So the first one is frog eye. It's caused by a wood rot fungus called Bostoceria. The distinction of it is its margins are sharp from spring through fall. Okay. The other one is called apple scab. And in the spring, uh, and it only lasts a few hours, it starts off green spots, then rapidly turns brown because it immediately starts sporulating. And the sporulation is what gives it the fuzzy looking margin. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can tell which one you got, frog's eye or scab, by sharp margins or fuzzy margins, depending on uh, the time of year. Again, if you're in the spring, May, June, um, then you can tell them apart. By August, forget it. Plus, in by August, you're past any control measure anyway. So is this harmful? Is this one of the, the aesthetic things that people it's, get bothered about, well, or is it actually harmful? It does to cause, the when it's really bad, it will cause severe defoliation. Mm -hmm. And it occurs on your know, crab apples or anything in the mollusk genus, including edible apples. And that includes the skin of the edible apples. And it is edible. You may not think so, because <laughs> it looks ugly. But it is edible. But if you don't like it, take a paring knife and just peel it off. Interesting. So don't be afraid to eat them right. if, if you're dealing with this. Right. Yeah, I don't know if I would be able to do it. You know, that's kind of yeah. the appeal of the apples when you get a really pretty one and you right. want to bite into it. But uh, yeah, interesting. <laughs> okay. All right, Marty, you brought something in as well. I did. I did. Um, you know, everything is awfully green. Mm -hmm. Grass is green, trees are green, evergreens are primarily green. <laughs> but for that very reason, I like to plant things that are not especially green. And I have a couple of examples here. Uh, one is this little sedum. The common name is blue spruce sedum for obvious reasons. Um, it's just got a nice little way about it. Uh, this is a, this is a, a flower stem. Okay, and it's already done blooming, but I left it on here so you can see this plant actually is only about this tall. It's a little evergreen ground cover. And when it blooms, it puts up, you know, 10 inch stalk or so, but the yellow flower is really pretty. And after it, after it fades like this, you can just take it off. I was gonna clean it up and spruce it up a little bit, pun intended, <laughs> but um, I thought I'd show you what it looks like. And then I've got a couple other things here too. I have some variegated burnet. I don't know how close you can get on this, but this is a lovely little plant. It mm -hmm. sends up tall, wiry stems with a little red drumstick kind of look to them, almost like a, a little alien, but smaller. And it's a wholly different species. And then also, again, there's a couple of leaves here that are not variegated. Whenever you plant a variegated plant, you want to maintain the variegation. If you get leaves that are not variegated, cut them off immediately. If you get a stem or a shoot that's sending out leaves that's not variegated, remove it because it'll revert to that and you'll lose the variegation. And that's the reason you planted it in the first place. So you can see these little green, completely green guys, mm -hmm. as opposed to these ones with the little white edge on them. So 
I'll remove those, but I left them on so I could show those now to you. Now, do you cut those all the way back? You cut the, take out the stem that has the, the non-variegation gotcha. on it. Gotcha, Take okay. it out. And then... But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is a plant, the, the, it doesn't, have, this plant is not variegated. I'm sorry, this is a burnet. This is a semisifija, and it's got purple leaves. Now, when the leaves first come out, they're kind of greenish, mm -hmm. but then they get a purple cast, and you can see on the back side here, the stem has a real purplish cast to it. These also come in green, but these purple variegated ones are awfully nice because, again, not green. And when you plant things that have a variegation or a different colored leaf, you get visual interest even if the plant isn't blooming. I don't know why this isn't more popular. Some of my clients, I have to talk them into this, and then they're like, wow, that really shows up nice. You think. <laughs> okay. Just a nice little pop of color. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And here's another one. This is a tricertus. It's a toad lily. And the reason they call it that is because the, the flowers are speckled like a toad. There's a little spider web on there. This is my favorite variety called samurai. And the sword-shaped leaves have variegation on the edges. Toad lilies also come in um, a plain-leaved variety. And these are a fall-blooming little flower. They mm -hmm. look very delicate, but they're actually very hardy. And they're easy to grow in a shade, part shade area where it's damp. And the flowers aren't very large. But if you have a place that's shaded or semi-shaded, little dampness right by the door where you come in and out, these are just lovely, mm -hmm. really nice. Nice little subtle pops of color for people, like you said, who yeah. have a lot of green or would sure. like a lot of green. Just some subtle. And I have, and I have one more. One okay. More. This is Hypericum, and it's got a, usually Hypericum has a green leaf on it, and it's this, but this one is yellow with a green center. It's got yellow around the edges, and then this little sprout of green comes up as the leaf matures. This is a smaller Hypericum, some of them are a little bit taller, but there are all kinds of shrubs and perennials that you can uh, incorporate into your garden. And people always think of the bloom on a plant, but the whole plant, the mm -hmm. whole plant has this, you know, this whole season. And if it has variegation, you got visual interest in it, even if it never flowers. Excellent. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to Jim who always has a critter or two or some other things to share. You know, this, this uh, today I brought in uh, a branch from my favorite tree, and that's the quaking aspen. You know, if you've ever traveled out west into the mountainous areas, you see these great big groves of aspen. They're beautiful trees, and when, when the wind blows, these little things, the, the, the leaves just shimmer. I mean, mm -hmm. I just love to listen to them shimmer, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a nice tree, and then they get yellow foliage in the fall. Mm -hmm. There are some drawbacks, so, and I would not advise anyone to plant quaking aspen near your garden because these trees will put out sucker roots. So those sucker roots can go out as, as far as 30 feet, wow. and then, then, they, then they produce these little suckers that, that come out, and uh, you know that, that can be an individual tree. Uh, you can chop those off you know, take some roots with them and then plant them as another tree. I started out with two quaking aspen and then during the winter months the deer came around and they rubbed the bark off both of them. I was so sad. <laughs> but I called my friends in Wisconsin. They said, well, all you have to do is just take a chainsaw and cut them down to ground level and you'll have more of them coming up. Shut and up. they were, they were, <laughs> <laughs> they were indeed right. I had aspen all over the place. Wow. So there are disadvantages. If you, you have to have a good amount of the land, maybe an acre or two, if you're going to plant aspen. But I have mine planted in front of my white pine and it's absolutely beautiful in the fall bit. when you get the yellow foliage of the aspen mm -hmm. in front of the green foliage of the uh, pine. Mm -hmm. uh, the other disadvantage of these things is that they do produce, depends on the sex, I have all male plants, so they produce catkins in the spring. They're, they're about, oh, maybe five or six inches long. In the spring, generally it's in, uh, when they produce catkins, it's generally in, in April. And, uh, you know, that can be several nuisance because they drop after about three weeks. That's the male flower. 
Mm. So now, uh, they do produce seeds, a female produces seeds. I don't have any um, uh, that produces seeds, but there are some disadvantages. But if you have the, the area, property, they have enough space, these are really beautiful trees. And the fact is that they do get white bark, and mm -hmm. they're resistant to bronze birch borer, which is a big factor. If you try to grow yeah. birch trees, European birch trees, you have a problem with bronze birch borer, and so these do not get bronze birch borer. So it's really a nice, uh, really nice tree. We've had questions over the years: where can you purchase quaking aspen? It's difficult to find a nursery that has them. But I've I found that the Arbor Day Foundation, Arbor Day Foundation, you can go to the internet and find that they do sell them. And I bought mine. They come as bare root trees, about maybe two feet in height, bare root. You get them early in the spring and plant them, and they, they develop into really nice, nice Interesting. trees. Interesting. Yeah. So I have a question about something you mentioned earlier. How can the average person know if they have a male or a female tree? Oh, you can't. You've got to wait until they start producing catkins okay. or, or seeds. Okay. Yeah. So when you get it, when you receive it from the nursery, you won't have you, any idea. No, you but, really but that's won't. not a problem if there are no other sex on the opposite, anywhere near you. Ah. So I'll say, you know, you won't get the seeds unless they're close enough to cross pollinate. Gotcha. And since this is not native, is this native to Illinois? Oh, it's native to northern Illinois. Northern yes. Illinois. Okay. Very far okay. northern Illinois. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. But they do well all o all over the state. I, and you know, like I said, if you have the place, they're really nice trees. And like I said, when they wind blows and they shimmer, it's just mm -hmm. great. Nice, mm. relaxing. Very nice, relaxing. Nice, relaxing. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of silvery in the summer, oh, yeah, and then yeah, they yeah. turn yeah, gold in the fall. They're really neat trees. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I, don't, I don't think I've seen a mature one of these, and yeah, if I have... Yeah, they're not commonly planted, not because they do have these problems with the suckers. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay, we'll have to look for one. All right, Jim, we're going to go back to you mm -hmm. with fasciation. Yes. You've fasciation was first written about in 1000 A.D., wow. and in that time, they thought fasciation was caused by a fairy. <laughs> they didn't understand fungi until the 18, uh, you know, in the, until we were in the 1900s <laughs> uh, really well. But anyway, we still don't know what causes this most of the time. 10% of the time, we know it is caused by a phenoxy herbicide. And the phenoxy herbicides weren't, you know, invented until after World War II, basically. But the fasciation does cause flattening of the branch mm -hmm. and twisting of the branch. This flattening of the branch may last one to three years, then it reverts back to normal growth. The problem is, if you let this get longer and longer, especially on your trees, the weight of the branch will cause the flat branch to break. Oh. And now you've got a hole in your branching so the recommendation is, when you see this flattening growth, <coughs> whack it off. And in this case, with this one here, you'd whack it off here because you've got a normal branch. With this one, it's happened to be a forsythia, you're cutting it all the way down to the ground. So whether it's in a bush or your tree or your herbaceous plants, because herbaceous plants have gotten mm -hmm. it, and I've actually had it develop in a house plant that I had been growing inside for two years, in the third year I had it, it started going flat. And I definitely will tell you, <laughs> we were not using herbicides in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we, we don't know most of the time why we get the fasciation. But you know, if you don't want it, I do, so send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fairies theory, actually. Yeah. Well, we should just stick with that. Now, well, where oh, it goes... Hey, one other thing. Sure. When it's on a rose and I had to take the thorns off, uh, the thorns were so thick, it looked like a pin cushion because wow. it's not like a thorn here and there. It's like 10 or 15 thorns in the same area. So you can't hardly find a place to pick it up and touch it without getting a thorn in your finger. So wow. not only does it flatten, but any uh, stickers, thorns, whatever on that stem multiply also. Wow. Now, the part where it starts to curve, that's yeah. still living, right? That's, well, yeah, it's it's all like it's this living. It's all living yeah. until you cut it off. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. That is really neat, isn't it? It is. It really is. Yeah. Okay. Marty, you have a frog house. I do. I have a, It's a toad house. A toad actually. house. I'm sorry. <coughs> toad house. My friend gave me this pot 
with a beautiful mother-in-law tongue in it for my Hassansevaria for my house. And I just, I admired the pot at her house before. <laughs> and I said, well, it's just beautiful. And then she took the plant out of it and put a, um, another plant in it and gave me the whole thing. I said, oh, Julie, that's wonderful. Had it in my living room, matched perfectly. It was so pretty. <laughs> and then I caught it with a branch of the Christmas tree. Bam, right on the hardwood floor. And it split right down the middle. I mean, it broke right down the middle. At least it was a clean break. Yes, it certainly was. <laughs> but this pot is so pretty. It is pretty. I just love the color. Mm -hmm. I just love it. So I took both halves and I set it out in my um, garden. Put it out in the perennial bed. Um, one's kind of underneath the tree peony and the other one is kind of nestled in where the sedum and the roses join up. And the color is wonderful. I've got um, light colored mulch. I've got cypress mulch. So uh, this just gleams against it and it's got a high glaze finish on it. So toads and spiders and other little creatures that live in your garden and help you eat things that you don't want in your garden like to shelter in here. Okay. So anything can be a, a toad house. I mean, if you have an old bucket or something, but you know, when you break a pot that you really, really liked, <laughs> and it's really pretty, you can, you can do that. Just, just nestle it down in um, on, at the foot of something, and toads will live in there in the heat. You can even, I mean, where I have these is a very sunny bed, but it provides them a little bit of shade, and you know, the plants shade the pot, and the pot shades the toad. I have a toad that lives on my porch and currently, we've named her, we've decided it's a girl. <laughs> and she uh, lives in one of my planters and mm -hmm. she's wreaking havoc on said plant. And so, <laughs> she likes to dig yes, down. she digs down, down in there and so Where I have cool. to fill it sure. back in. Sure. And so she's just sort of made that her home, but I really like that because oh, yeah. she can stay and she won't be, you know, destroying my flowers yeah. that are on the porch. So yeah. that's a really neat idea. Oh yeah, and it's I. It's not the first pot I've broken, people. It's really <laughs> sad, but they just they just make a lovely accent, and of course they're weatherproof. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Multi uh, reusing. reusing. Absolutely something. wonderful. Use it up, wear it out. Make it do or do without. <laughs> <laughs> Marnie's always got a a clever quip. Go All right, Jim, you have now. This our next guest has been here before. Yes. In a different form. In a different form. <laughs> okay. So you folks that watched the program about uh, a week ago, I brought in a, the caterpillar, or the question mark caterpillar, that was feeding on hackberry. Well, now it's changed into the pupa stage, and I just brought that in because I thought they're really pretty. They've mm -hmm. got these silver markings on it, and eventually then this will change into a beautiful uh, butterfly that's sort of orangey brown in color with m different brown markings on it. So it's just a you know curious thing to, to see in, mm -hmm. in the garden. Now, and you said any day now this will I be? I would say any day. I would say maybe even today will emerge as a butterfly. Wow. Yeah. Man, that would be great if that would happen here in the next, what, 10 minutes or yeah, so. It, it <laughs> might, yeah. It Let's it go, might. question mark. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure or anything. We've got a yeah. few minutes left. <laughs> All right, Jim, back to you. Uh -huh. We have a question. Uh, Vicki in Clinton, she writes, we found these slugs growing at the bottom of our climbing rose bush in the cedar chips. The orange pieces were sticking out of the ground and we dug around and found the white bulbs. Some of the bulbs are kind of hollow. What is this? Well, first of all, it's not a slug. Mm -mm. Okay. It is the pruning body of a decay fungus. Uh, it basically, it's the sexual reproduction of this fungus. This group of fungi, and there are many different kind of fungi that fall into this group, they're called stink molds. They do smell when you crush them. And they all have some visual appearance of a male sexual organ. Um, there's nothing you want to treat the soil with. What you want to do is, if you don't like that and can't handle it, basically scoop that area out and dig a hole and bury that mulch deeper in the ground <laughs> so it can't come to the surface. Uh, this is a wood rot that attacks 
any of the organic mulches on the ground. And you, know, you may or may not ever see it because it varies with wherever the spores get blown uh, in the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do need moisture. The, moisture uh, the mulch does have to be moist for it to get to grow and produce the spore structures. Now it may be growing in the mulch without the spore structure. Uh, you know, most people don't know they have the decay going on until they make the fruiting body. No. But basically, you either live with it and say, oh, look what I got. <laughs> yeah. Or you just dig it up and haul it off and get rid of some, you know, put some more new mulch mm -hmm. back. All right, two choices. All right, Marty, this one's for you. Fred in Springfield says, okay. I have what I believe is Russian sage. Mm -hmm. The bees and butterflies love it. I can mow around it or trim and the bees leave me alone. I use your show as an excuse not to trim much of the bushes to benefit the pollinators. That'll Am boy. I helping the pollinators by not trimming? You are. Ding, ding, ding. That's excellent. And this is, in fact, Russian sage. Uh, very easy to grow. Mm -hmm. Loves uh, hot, dry conditions. This, if, if you have a place that you're having trouble growing something because it's gravelly or it's just too darn hot and dry, not for Russian sage it isn't. Plant them in it and then the pollinators just adore it. Just absolutely love it. You can stand there near it. You can see this is kind of a mailbox planting and they have a little clematis there too. And it, it blooms for a well, pretty long season. And it keeps, keep, once it starts blooming, it keeps putting on branches that bloom and bloom until frost. And it's quite pretty. Mm -hmm. You've got some fabulous late summer color. And yeah, you can stand there and watch all kinds of insects, bees and butterflies and wasps, all kinds of things, all kinds of pollinators. Well, just, they're just busy, busy, busy on those. And it's a great opportunity when you have pollinator plants like that mm -hmm. to be able to watch them in action because you don't typically get to do that, mm -hmm. you know, unless you have plants like that in your yard. So that's, maintenance it's wise, cool. is that a low maintenance, high maintenance plant? Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. Um, usually I wait until they um, start their new growth in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then you can see if they had any winter dieback. I usually leave them up for the winter, uh, much like lavender and uh, grasses, some other things. I think, I think it has a tendency to help um, protect the crown in gotcha. the cold winter. Um, and then just whenever it sprouts out, if any of the old wood has new leaves on it, you cut it back about an inch into where the leaves are coming out. Also, you can prune it to just to reduce the size. Mm -hmm. If it wound up being really robust and it's hanging over the sidewalk a little too far, it's scratching the car or whatever it is, you can just reduce the thing. But try not to <laughs> shear it. This is not the Marines, okay? <laughs> it's, a, it's the Russian sage. <laughs> so, so we try to let it grow, you know, let it, let it look like a fabulous lavender firework. Wonderful. Okay, Jim. Betty in Joliet has a question about wormy fruit. I have two apple trees that we planted four years ago. They produce fruit, but the fruit is misshapen and wormy. What can I do this fall to help them? And I'm going to listen because I have the same problem. Well, you know, we really have a problem. Uh, if, you, if you think you're going to produce apples and pears and plums and peaches like you get in a grocery store, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible. Almost. There are, and the problem today anymore is that the universities no longer produce spray spray schedules. They used to have a uh, spray schedule. Well, they mm -hmm. don't do that. They don't produce those anymore. So I think what I would do if, if for that person is having that problem, I would find out a store that can that um, sells Bonide, B-O-N-I-D-E mm -hmm. products. That's a company that particularly caters to the homeowner, mm -hmm. and they produce this uh, chemical called Complete fruit tree spray and that chemi that uh, compound contains captan which is a fungicide malathion mm -hmm. an insecticide and mm -hmm. carbaryl and it also has a little spray schedule attached to the container so I think if you if you want to produce fruit that looks a little similar to what you get in the <laughs> grocery store follow that spray schedule and I would use that product Okay, and then that'll take care of the, the wormy. Yeah, there's so many <coughs> insects and mites that mm -hmm. attack uh, fruit trees that it's almost impossible to produce, you know, absolutely blemish free sure. fruit. Okay. But this is true, though. It's like scab. You can eat all those insects if you can tolerate them. 
And I have, Jim, and they're delicious. <laughs> right. <laughs> a little bit of protein. Yeah. Boys, yeah. boys. Oh, oh my please. goodness. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for coming today. We really appreciate all of your expertise. I don't know if I'll be able to eat a an apple with scale. I just don't know if I can do it. Well, you try one that's wormy. Oh, I don't know. That's truth here, that I can way. do the scab before okay. I can do the half a worm. Yikes. Yeah. I don't know. But, you know, you never know until you try, right? Well, thank That's you guys right. all so much for coming and bringing your, your uh, show and tells with you. And too bad our guy didn't uh, hatch yeah, out during well, the show. He, he, Maybe yeah. next time. Maybe, Maybe next, next time. time. And make sure you find us on all of our socials. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. You can also check out Victoria's podcast. Um, there's always an interesting topic going on there. And we will see you next week on Mid-American Gardener. Thanks so much for watching. Good night.